You know, there's some question about your lease, Mr. Russell. What do you mean? That house shouldn't have been rented. Miss Norman rushed those papers through our attorney's office. She did not use proper channels. Why should anyone object? That house is not fit to live in. No one's been able to live in it. It doesn't want people. Hi, welcome to Around the World in 80s Movies. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. I've been doing film reviews since 1996. You can read all of my written work there at Quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. While you're there, I do encourage you to go back to the 1990s with me for my other podcast called To the 90s and Beyond. You can find the link to that at my website, Quipster.net. Today I'm going to be getting into the third part of this three-part series looking at haunted house films of the 1980s. We're going to end it out with the beginning of the 1980s with one of the more overlooked but one of the most appreciated for film buffs of the 1980s. It's called The Changeling and it's an R-rated film. It does have brief nudity, disturbing images, violence, and language. The runtime is an hour and 47 minutes. The main star is George C. Scott, with supporting roles going to Trish Vandeveer, Melvin Douglas, Madeline Sherwood, Jean Marsh, and John Colicos. The director is Peter Medak, and the screenplay credited to William Gray and Diana Maddox. Now, in terms of the making of The Changeling, we go back to the late 70s, about 1978. There was a, a Winnipeg-based music and household gadget company, KTEL International, and they had formed a partnership with producers, Garth Drabinsky, who was an entertainment industry lawyer based in Toronto who got into the filmmaking business, with Joel Michaels, who happened to be a former client, an American of Drabinsky's, a former client of Drabinsky's, who was struggling to make theatrical shows in Canada. Drabinsky and Michaels, they had won Best Picture at the Canadian Film Awards for their Toronto-made film, starring Elliot Gould and Christopher Plummer, this bank robbery thriller called The Silent Partner. And their partnership was called Tiberius Entertainment Limited. Tiberius was built on producing films and stage productions in Canada where the dollar stretched a lot farther without the high overhead of Hollywood studios. Now, seeking their next idea, Joel Michael's wife, Diana Maddox, she read an article about this man named Russell Hunter, and his experiences in the late 1960s while he was living in the Henry Treat Rogers Mansion in the Cheeseman Park neighborhood of Denver, Colorado. Russell Hunter, he was a a music arranger for CBS TV. He had moved into this mansion to work on his music. It came at a very cheap price. Nobody really wanted to move into this place for reasons he came to learn himself. He came to experience strange phenomena while in that house. Loud banging at 6 a.m. every morning. Faucets that would find themselves turning on. Doors would open that were once closed. The walls sometimes would shake so violently that mounted pictures would fall to the floor. Russell tried his best to try to investigate the source of all of this strange happening. So he and an architect friend, they went into the home and discovered a staircase that was hidden in a closet that led to the third floor, secret attic. The attic contained a trunk full of books. There was a journal from a century ago, and that journal had the writings of a young disabled boy that was kept in isolation, whose favorite toy happened to be a red rubber ball. Sometime later, Hunter became spooked when he heard bouncing in the attic. He opened the door, and that revealed a red rubber ball. It bounced out of the door, down the staircase, before ultimately vanishing. Hunter felt this place might be haunted. He held the seance. It revealed this boy as heir to a fortune that was passed along by his maternal grandmother upon reaching adulthood. But the boy became gravely ill 
In his youth, and his family was worried that the fortune was going to pass along to another branch of the family. So they kept the boy in isolation and adopted another boy from a nearby orphanage to pose as him, the changeling, miraculously cured, at least by public appearances. Now, when the boy in the attic finally died of his ailments, he was secretly buried while the adopted boy went on to adulthood to live a life of wealth and success. The seance also revealed the location of the boy's buried body. It was under a house elsewhere in Denver. After receiving permission to dig there, Hunter discovered skeletal remains and a gold medallion that had the boy's name inscribed. Hunter kept the discovery to himself, which caused the bouncing sound to become more pronounced within the house, as if the boy's ghost was mad that he was not taking this information elsewhere. After Hunter called in priests to try to exorcise the house, The bouncing did stop, at least for a time, before becoming much more violent. The piano in the home begins playing on its own. Windows fly open. Mirrors shatter around the house. Hunter finally decides it's time to leave. And he returns years later only to see the house raised for a high-rise apartment building built on its location. As it was being raised in the last act of The Ghost, The home's walls come down and kills a bulldozer operator there on the site, at least according to Russell Hunter's story. Now, Diana Maddox gave her husband, Joel Michaels, an audio cassette of Russell Hunter verbally relating this story. This gave Michaels chills so profound that he decided to fly to Denver the next day to secure the film rights from Hunter. Meanwhile, Maddox provided a script treatment under her writing pseudonym of Adrian Moral involving a protagonist who sleuths into the past to discover the ghost's source of anguish. The title of her 45-page treatment was called The House on Chessman Park. That was changed from Cheeseman because it just seemed to sound better. It wasn't necessarily going to be set in Denver. Joel Michael's sole stipulation for the story was that he did not want it to be an obvious haunted house setting typically used in films. No, Big, creaky, countryside English manor, no scary, gothic mansion located somewhere in the American South. Their house for this story should be something that would make someone want to live within, and the film should also feel very modern, very urban in other respects to try to contrast with the other story that's going to be shown set in the past. Now, the first full script based on Maddox's treatment was written by the screenwriting team of this American named Alan Scott and this Canadian named Chris Bryant. Scott and Bryant had been known primarily for a previous collaboration, the 1973 Nicholas Rogue film called Don't Look Now, and that featured a similar journey of trying to deal with grief after the loss of a loved one. However, the Scott Bryant script bore little resemblance to the Maddox treatment that was extrapolated from Hunter's story, and it was summarily overhauled. Now, to stay on target for the next revision, Maddox decided to be personally involved helping with the revision after Garth Drabinsky secured the services of Canadian-born scribe William Gray. Bill Gray, he was somebody that Drabinsky had hired years back for his free entertainment listings magazine called Impact. Now, the one snag to the script after it was all written was that it seemed like it was going to be very pricey. There were a lot of supernatural elements that were going to require an effects budget, typically not found in Canadian productions up to that date, including the burning down in the end of a three-story Victorian mansion and a wheelchair that's going to have to chase people around the home. Trebinsky estimated that this kind of movie was going to be at least over $5 million to produce, and that meant that he was going to need a way to pull in those kinds of funds for what would eventually become the most expensive Canadian film made to that point. Now, Garth Drabinsky, because he was a lawyer, he used his experience to take advantage of the Income Tax Act in Canada, which gave preferential treatment for certain things that were done in Canada, and he was able to use his skills to translate that into a film production made in Canada. It would provide incentives for investors similar to those found for the building of new apartments or oil exploration. So he used this prospectus with the Ontario Securities Commission that promised that the film was going to meet the standards to qualify as a Canadian production. That meant a majority Canadian cast, a majority Canadian crew, and 75% of the costs of the film were going to be paid to Canadians. Durbinsky, to fund the film, would sell 264 shares at $25,000 each for a total of $6.6 million, offering a tax shelter with 100% write-off protection should things go sour. 
Now, the plot for the finished film involves an esteemed New York pianist slash composer named John Russell. Russell accepts a lectureship position in Seattle because he needs solitude and restoration following the tragic deaths of his wife and daughter in a roadside accident. A woman named Claire Norman, she's a volunteer at the local Historical Preservation Society. She decides to move him into this massive old Victorian Gothic mansion located just outside the city that has not had anybody living in it for the last 12 years. Russell soon discovers that the house is not as uninhabited as he thought. Things begin to occur within the house. Banging noises. Bathroom water taps turn on and off. A boy's image he glimpses within the water of the bathtub. Although, maybe, it's just his grief-fueled imagination for losing his wife and child. He's told that this house, it does have a history. It doesn't want people living in it. Later on, John Russell senses that this house seems to be wanting to tell him something. He discovers, through clues the house leaves him, that there's a locked secret room that resembles a nursery in the attic containing a rusty wheelchair, an antique music box that plays a song that he himself had been composing since he had entered the house. With the help of Claire Norman, Russell soon digs into the sordid history of the house, including conducting a revealing seance that leads them to make contact with this spirit within who provides more clues to a 70-year-old mystery that has to be solved in order for the spirit to find peace. Now, there's a lot more to the story than that. I'll get into a little bit as we go along. Now, Garth Drabinsky felt that Canadian films, they were not lucrative in the past, at least compared to Hollywood films. They lacked the star power of American movies. Drabinsky was frustrated by their previous effort, The Silent Partner, because that film lacked really solid American distribution. So this time, they wanted to secure a marquee name that was going to interest investors and a U.S. distributor right off the bat, so they didn't have to worry about it later. Paying top dollar for major stars meant that the budget was going to escalate, so they decided they were going to shoot in Vancouver, British Columbia, instead of the United States, a place where Drabinsky felt that the Canadian film industry should eventually center. Joel Michaels felt that the location really was unimportant anyway, but the funding by Canadian investors was conditional on the film actually being shot in Canada. Now, the first actor they pursued to star in their film was Richard Dreyfuss. Dreyfus was somebody who had a previous relationship with Diana Maddox because she was his former acting coach. For the role of the villain of the film, this man named Joseph Carmichael, that was offered to George C. Scott. The setting, by the way, was revised in the script from Canada to America because they thought a Canadian senator was not really as equivalent to a United States senator in terms of the kind of power and prominence that was necessary for that villainous tycoon, Joseph Carmichael. Now, Dreyfus was nearly signed to star in this film when Scott replied and announced that he loved the script, but he did not want to play the scheming senator. In fact, he wanted to star in the film. He wanted the main role of John Russell, and he also wanted, along with that, a role for his wife, Trish Vanderveer. Drabinsky and Michaels felt that they really could not refuse a star of Scott's caliber. They agreed to his conditions. They made him the star while they determined to look for another established star for the senator role. Scott's salary for the film was $1.25 million, paid in U.S. funds. That was a record at that point for the most salary given to a single actor in any Canadian film. And on top of that, he received 10% of the rental grosses. Meanwhile, Trish Vanderveer also took in a nice little sum, $375,000 for a supporting role. Now, one benefit of the shoot in Canada There was no studio that was going to tell them what they couldn't do. Now, there was a downside, though. The tax-sheltered laws did require a majority Canadian cast and crew, plus that 75% of costs paid to Canadians, and they also had to complete by a specified date or forfeit protection. Now, they initially looked for Canadian directors, but there really wasn't any available at that time that had any kind of big-budget production experience. Also, you know, George C. Scott, he had a reputation for being difficult to handle. He was a a notorious alcoholic. He sometimes had a vicious temper. So that would necessitate having a director that was going to be able to command the set and command George C. Scott's respect. So they compiled a list of potential directors from the United States and from Great Britain that might be able to fit the mold. And that included British film and theater director Tony Richardson. Richardson had kind of a a unique tie-in. He once revived Thomas Middleton and William Rowley's unrelated play called The Changeling. 
back in the 1950s and 1960s. But they eventually targeted the co-director of performance and the director of Demon Seed, Donald Camel, because he was somebody, when they brought him in, he really hit it off with George C. Scott. So they thought he could be somebody that could keep Scott in line. However, Camel demanded immediate changes once he was hired. He insisted that Vancouver provided all the wrong atmosphere, and they had to shoot in a real house, even though that was going to be more expensive, instead of a soundstage. The producers decided to indulge Camel with what they could. They flew Camel and the production designer Trevor Williams out to Toronto to scout houses, and Camel became enamored of this very small waterfront cottage in Oakville, Ontario, despite it lacking any of the gothic look that was described in the script. Now, the straw that eventually broke Camel's back was when he stated that the script actually wasn't really good enough. They needed a rewrite, and he also started making suggestions like they should shoot the entire film in black and white. Things that at this late stage of the game just were going to be too difficult to make fly. So they decided to get rid of Camel, and that proved to be a pretty costly firing in the end because Camel was a member of the Directors Guild of America, and they subsequently fined the producers $80,000 for firing Camel arbitrarily, and they had to buy out his contract. Now, only six weeks were left until the shoot was supposed to begin. They continued looking for a director, and they heard through a friend of a friend that there was this Hungarian-born director named Peter Medak, who is available. They screened his 1972 comedy called The Ruling Class, starring Peter O'Toole, and they were very impressed by that film's use of camera movements to cause great effect to the mood and tempo, And also because he was guiding Peter O'Toole, notoriously a difficult actor for a lot of directors to work with, that proved that Medak could handle somebody of maybe George C. Scott's temperament. So coincidentally, Medak had spent the last four years actually looking for just the right ghost story that he wanted to adapt into a Hitchcockian-style psychological terror film. Something where the audience's imagination of what's around a dark corner or coming down the stairs was going to scare them much more so than seeing a bunch of gruesome gore, as had been so popular toward the late 1970s. Now, Medak read the script for The Changeling, and when he did, he became so petrified, so filled with fright, that he actually could not get out of his seat in order to rejoin his family who were playing a game downstairs. This was something that Medak had not felt while reading a script since he was trying out as second unit director for Robert Wise on The Haunting. He knew he had to make this movie. However, it turned out that he found out that Donald Camel, his friend, he had been recently fired from it. So he considered, because of loyalty to Camel, declining. But when he discussed it with Camel, Camel insisted Medak should absolutely take this film because he could probably make something great out of it. Now, Medak called for script revisions. He was going to steer away from some of the gimmicky shock scares that he found in the script. There were overdone notions of demonic possession that seemed to be borrowed from a lot of other recent films like The Exorcist or The Omen. Medak wanted believable psychological terror and suspense over a lot of unrealistic events happening all around the house, implosions and whatnot, and copious amounts of blood found all over the place. Medak also demanded that they should build a much larger, spookier home. The one that Camel had selected was just not going to be imposing or work for what he wanted to do. He wanted a house that was spacious enough that would allow them full camera movements all over the place, and he especially wanted a house that would have an eerie, creaky, dark staircase. Medak also wanted to replace some of the more common characters found in the script. He wanted his film to feature elites, rich, powerful people. He felt that audiences were entertained by displays of elegance, of luxuriousness. You know, they liked seeing giant mansions and fancy cars and people flying in Lear jets as part of their escapist entertainment. And the producers knew to take him seriously with his demands. In the prior five years, Medak had walked away from four film projects that were just about to shoot because of creative differences. Drabinsky and Michael bit the bullet. They agreed to Medak's vision. They postponed the shoot for two more weeks while returning to the original cost-saving plan of shooting in Vancouver, mostly on a soundstage. For the exteriors, they found an old mansion in Vancouver that was set to be demolished. This was not a place that was going to work in and of itself, but that art director, Trevor Williams, did fit it with a three-sided, 
three-story, $200,000 facade resembling a spooky Victorian mansion. It was built around this house, complete with gingerbread, cornices, trims, and carvings, and they also added a garden and gates and a driveway to the front of the house. The mansion's interiors, those included three flights of stairs and 18 rooms, they were all built at West Vancouver's Panorama Studios. And while these were being built, they decided to shoot on location in New York City and Seattle for those establishing shots, while Victoria and Vancouver would substitute for them in other regards. Now, one snag did occur shortly before the production did begin. An article was written from McLean's magazine claiming that Drabinsky was personally taking $2 million in fees out of its $6.6 million cost to fund his own self, his roles, as the co-producer, as the lawyer, and as the distributor of the film. The article also criticized the deal that Drabinsky secured with the Ontario Securities Commission prospectus. They claimed that this was something that was pushed through without the normal amount of scrutiny that was afforded to other investments. Drabinsky called this article a complete hatchet job, one that grossly exaggerated the numbers he was going to receive, and he threatened immediately to sue McLean's for financial damages. Pulling strings with McLean's editor friend Peter Newman, Drabinsky secured a letter that was going to show nervous investors this letter was going to assert his honesty and integrity as a businessman. Despite the letter, though, the article, when it was finally published, proved to be damaging. Investment interest evaporated just weeks away from the start of production, and they were $2 million short of their goal. Worse, George C. Scott now refused to show up to the shoot unless his acting fee was in his bank account. Unless it was there, he was not even going to show up. Jurbinski had to work fast. He had to hustle friends for loans so that he could cover that $2 million and also satisfy Scott's demands. And he just, like the weekend before the shoot beginning, got the money into Scott's bank account. Jurbinski was absolutely furious over this incident, and he launched a $10 million libel lawsuit against McLean's, the largest such lawsuit to that date in Canada. When it was all said and done, Jurbinski had to settle for $75,000 and a printed apology. And by the way, you know, if you know your history of Garth Drabinsky, you know that eventually he was jailed for fraud in 2011 for an unrelated venture sometime later. Now, the shoot breezed by without major incident. There was some budget overages, though, that were caused by weather delays, a poorly planned pyrotechnics sequence for the climax. It resulted in the, the fire department having to visit because it was a lot of extraneous damage that was done to the surrounding area. George C. Scott had a percentage stake in the picture, so he and Vandiver ended up chipping in to pay for the extra budget that was necessary for a little bit more of a cut in their profit. Maddox originally intended cut when it was all said and done. It was re-edited sometime later because the producers felt that it seemed a little too European, including the intended intro where there was going to be much more music playing by John Russell, intercut with the scene of his family dying. It got very artistic, and they felt that the more artistic it became, the less commercial it was. So they wanted him to remove some of that. Now, in the end, it's one of the oddities is that they actually accepted the film carrying an R rating, given that it doesn't really have any sex, it doesn't have any gore. You know, there's only some very brief, harsh language. You know, if you remove that, it probably would be suitable for playing on television without any kind of editing. So, you know, it is intense, and there is the death of a child shown within the film. But if you were to release this today, this would easily secure a PG-13 rating. Now, when it was released, The Changeling received, well, mixed positive reviews from critics. But nevertheless, in Canada, it was considered a pretty good thing at the time. It won Best Canadian Picture at the inaugural Genie Awards, which is now called the Canadian Screen Awards. That was back in 1980 from the Academy of Canadian Cinema. It also took awards, Genie Awards, for Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Foreign Actor for George C. Scott, Best Supporting Foreign Actress for Trish Vandeveer, Best Sound Editing, Best Overall Sound, Best Cinematography, and Best Art Direction. The only category, in fact, it didn't take, it lost twice. Best Supporting Actress, both of its actresses, Canadians, Helen Burns, who plays a medium that delivers an impassioned seance, and, and Frances Hyland, they lost to Geneviève Bujold for Murder by Decree. The Changeling, though, also won the Golden Reel Award, in 1980 for the biggest box office performer among Canadian films. That year, it earned $3 million in Canada and another $15 million or so in the United States and elsewhere. The Changeling, when it was released, it 
represented a refreshing change of pace from the slasher movie genre. You know, Friday the 13th and Halloween, those were riding high at the time. It returned the horror genre, if you want to call this horror, albeit briefly, to a more suspenseful approach that emphasized style and restraint in the spirit of other classic ghost films like The Uninvited and The Haunting and The Legend of Hell House and, of course, the aforementioned Don't Look Now. Reportedly, Steven Spielberg, he screened The Changeling when he was making Poltergeist to his crew several times for inspiration of what they should be aiming to achieve. Spielberg and Martin Scorsese, by the way, are huge fans of this film. In fact, Scorsese placed it on his list of the 11 scariest horror films of all time and his 2021 list of his all-time 35 favorite films. Both Spielberg and Scorsese bought 35 millimeter film prints of The Changeling for their personal collections, and even Stephen King, the horror maestro, places it among his list of 22 all-time favorite films as well. And there's a good reason why, if you watch this film, it's all very nicely put together by Medek. There's an excellent moody production design here by Trevor Williams, a cinematography by Montreal-born Jean Coquillon, that emphasizes this very roving, very inquisitive camera. You can almost feel the ghost watching at various times, even though you don't see it. Gene Griggs, visual effects, they're not very pronounced, but they lend some additional punch. And the atmospheric scoring by Rick Wilkins, which was arranged by frequent John Williams collaborator Ken Womberg, it's all very haunting and elegant and will stay with you long after this film is over. This really has such a chilling atmosphere, a very interesting, sophisticated approach to its mystery. I think the only disappointment that I had in the film was kind of a, a convenient ending involving the possession of a gold locket and one where scares don't quite register with the buildup required the image of an empty wheelchair chasing somebody down the stairs through the mansion. That might not work for a lot of audiences today who are inured to this kind of stuff, but just remember, for its era, this definitely was a novel and a very effective approach. The editing here by Lou Lombardo is excellent. He did The Wild Bunch, and he does more great work here. So the weaknesses, whatever you can ascribe to it, are very minor. I mean, maybe the protagonist discovering all of the circumstances of the house's supernatural eruptions is all very convenient. But I do think that in the defense of the movie, I think George C. Scott was the right choice. He's a very, very skilled actor, obviously. You know, he keeps all of it very plausible just by the look on his face, portraying Russell in this time of loneliness and grief. He's constantly thinking about the proverbial ghosts of his lost loved ones. The way that you see the pain on George C. Scott's face makes you realize that he thinks he might actually be in communication with his dead daughter. He thinks that there's a connection between him and maybe the loved ones he saw tragically die in front of his eyes. I think the Changeling, it's, it's a stylishly effective chiller. It might be a little bit light on shock scares, certainly, the first time you view it, but the, the eerie imagery, the haunting feelings that stay with you long after its conclusion, I think that the, the slow buildup pays off great dividends when you, you know, get home and you start thinking you see or hear things in the middle of the night. It just stays with you in that way. This is also a, a really qual good quality story about how human tragedy lingers beyond the events that you see. And so this is a movie that stays with you. And for that, I'm going to give The Changeling three and a half stars out of four. Three and a half stars on my scale means that I do think that The Changeling is a good film and definitely worth going out of your way to see if you haven't seen it already. If you like these kinds of ghost stories and haunted house films, this is one of the most overlooked and one of the best. It definitely does deserve to rank up there with films like The Haunting and The Uninvited and some of these other great classic works. Enough to give it three and a half stars out of four. Now, Michaels and Drabinsky, they later tried to remake the film. They signed with the film company, in fact, and they produced a script. In fact, they talked to Medak. He was considered to return. Medak considered maybe putting Anthony Hopkins as the star to replace the George C. Scott role, but the production never seemed to come to pass for a variety of reasons. Back in 2014, Jeremy Levering, he was rumored to be helming, although he wanted a completely different script than the one that uh, Michaels and Drabinsky drew up. But, uh, you know, that never seemed to quite gain traction either. Then in 2018, they announced that uh, the film was going to be written and directed by Mark Steven Johnson. If you're a fan of you know Marvel films before the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like Ghost Rider and Daredevil, he was the director of both of those. 
And his version was going to be set in Venice, Italy, kind of as an homage to Don't Look Now. But that didn't come to pass. And then in 2020, just recently, so in the last year or so, that changed. Uh, a screenwriter, Tab Murphy, and this Finnish television director named Anders Engström, they were going to do a, this film and they were going to move it to Ireland because that's where they felt a lot of ghost stories should emanate. Produced by Uwe Schott and Stephen Arndt for Tom Tickfer's uh, Berlin-based company, X-Film. The sales outfit Cornerstone Films purchased the rights to turn it into their first feature production. And Joel Michaels, by the way, was also going to return as the producer. Where it's at, I don't really know. It was supposed to be made and appear in the 2020 version of Cannes Film Festival, but it just was not there. They're still trying to push it forward, but it just has not gotten made yet. So it's on the cusp of getting a remake or a re-envisioning or reboot or whatever you want to call it. I'm kind of mixed about whether they should remake it or not. I feel like this kind of film has been recycled so many times. It's been an influence for so many really great filmmakers, including uh, Alejandro Almenabar's The Others, most notably, because The Others borrow so much from The Changeling. Both films have haunted houses, obviously. There's a pianist resident. There are tragic ghosts and the backstory there. A seance with a medium who writes all of the answers down and the uh, a groundskeeper named Mr. Tuttle. That's an homage that was in The Others too this film uh the ring or ringu even originally from the japanese those are very much you know almost semi remakes of the changeling and what lies beneath with uh, harrison ford and michelle pfeiffer uh obviously borrowed a lot from this film as well guillermo del toro he claims this film is a masterpiece he's borrowed from it in either style or substance in so many of his horror films like the devil's backbone and crimson peak most notably which also featured a red ball and a wheelchair and his production he was executive producer for j.a bayona's uh, the orphanage which also borrows a lot from this film too so whether it gets remade or not it's been recycled into so many other really really strong horror films that you can watch i think a remake would find a hard time not only living up to the original but also might seem a little redundant since so many of the ideas of the changeling have been put into other very prominent and very popular horror films over the years so i'm okay with it never getting remade personally now you might have your own opinions on that if you want to share them with me you can find my contact information at my website that's at quipster.net q-w-i-p-s-t-e-r.net you'll find links to my twitter feed my facebook page my instagram and also my email i do encourage you to email me if you haven't done so already just let me know what you think of the show or any other suggestions you might have for it quipster.net is where to go as far as next week, we're going to start another three-part series, very similar to this one. You know, we've kind of been in this vein of scary movies. I'm recording this in the middle, toward the end of September, so I might as well keep the horror movies rolling, at least through the end of the Halloween season, at least for 2021, when I'm recording this. And I'm going to start with one of the biggest films, one of the most popular horror films for anybody who indulges in horror films of the 1980s. Stanley Kubrick's great masterwork, The Shining, from 1980, the same year as The Changeling. And it has, surprisingly, a lot in common with The Changeling, even though they were made completely separate and they were not influences of one another. For reasons I will get into on the next episode. So if you haven't seen it in a while, or maybe if you haven't seen it at all, although I feel most of you have, I do encourage you to check out The Shining for the next episode. But until then, thank you everyone for joining me on this trip around the world in 80s movies. Movies.